can say that now, can't we? Yeah. All right. Are you in tune? That's what you can ask yourself while I ask the guitar. Are you in tune? <laughs> You know, Jesus, as we focus our hearts on him, he knows our past, right? He also knows our future, and he's got good things in store for you. There's a, a song coming later in the, in the service. Um, that says, let the weak say I'm strong and the spirit is alive in me. So I want you right now to say after me, I am strong. I am strong. And the spirit is alive in me. And the spirit is alive in me. Woo! Yeah. Hallelujah. And Larry would like the line that says, I say. You say it, right? You can't. When you speak it, it comes alive in you. Yeah. Proclaim it. Who believes in dreams? Who believes in visions of the future? Who believes God wants us to have fun? I'm set on you. You made a road in the wild, standing on ancient truth. I'm pressing on with my back to the past. And oh, let the young see visions of the future. And I say, oh, let the old dream dream. and stride with you first in like heaven in motion Jesus you make me new I'm pressing on with my back to the past and oh let the young see visions of the future and I sing oh I'm set on you. You made a road in the wild, standing on ancient truth. I'm pressing on with my back to you. Let me hear you sing it. Oh, let the young see visions of the future, and I sing oh. Let's break. We're going. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Good 
joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. <laughs> coming from the computer team. It's amazing we got this far with that music playing. Everybody give it up for just grace. I don't know what key that was in, but we were playing with some other music that whole time, but God is so good. Jesus is a real thing. me nothing and I just want the real thing no matter where it takes me I refuse to pray a word that doesn't move me and all I know right now is I'm ready and all I want right now is the real thing, Lord. You're the real thing, Lord. You're the real thing. Oh, you're the real thing, Jesus. My eyes are forward. Failure in the rear view, every dove behind me. I'm running with the wildfire of God inside me. So throw away the timeline, no more second guessing. It's plain to see my life is not my own, it's not about me. you're the real thing and in all my searching I finally realize that I'm alive to bring you glory and all that I am to love you my life behold you you're all my heart beats for and all that I have to serve you, my life, to praise you, you're all my heart beats for. We'll sing, you're all my heart. You're all my heart beats for.
are moving here. The Spirit is alive in us. Woo! There is no agenda. We just want to see you move. Take away the pressure. We have nothing left to prove. A fresh chance to worship your majesty. So we sing. Holy Spirit, my heart is open. I lift my hands to heaven. God, I know there is one here and now. Sing it again. This is my confession. I don't want to leave the same. You have my affection. Here I am, God, all of me. Oh, you're moving. A fresh chance. To worship your majesty. Holy Spirit, my heart is open. I lift my hands to heaven. God, I know there is more. Here and now, I'm fully yours. Holy Spirit, my heart is open. I lift my hands to heaven. God, I know there is more. Here and now, I'm fully yours. Jesus, you're the real thing.
I said, let's wait until, you know, we're four hours into our first flight and we'll see, we'll see how you feel about plane flights. But um, our boys, I, I haven't asked them, we asked them a little bit before, we'll see if, they, if they're willing to do this. They have a chant that they do because they're missionary kids to help inspire other kids to go. And so do you guys want to do it for them? Can you do it? Okay, so they're going to do the chant. Um, and uh, yeah, nice and loud, boys. Thank you. You guys can have a seat. 
Well, thank you, Pastor Larry, for inviting us. We are so blessed to be here, and we are extra blessed to be here today because I will tell you, I don't know that Satan wanted us to get here today. We were on our way up. Um, we live down in Racine, so it's about a five-hour drive, give or take. And our first two hours of our trip, we had a snowstorm. Um, and so that, you know, kind of delayed things. And we made it through the snowstorm, got north of it, and just really were having a lovely drive on the interstate, no problems. And then we heard that noise that you don't want to hear that sounded like a tire had blown. So we pulled off to the side of the road. Tires were fine, but van was not driving right. It was 2.30 on a Saturday, right? And we're going, we don't know what our options are. Like, we're in trouble. Um, but guys, I got to tell you, God is good. Because, I mean, we are here. It happened four miles outside of Eau Claire, right? So that's good. We had some friends in the area who picked us up. We found a body shop that was still open and got the van in. They knew our predicament. They worked past their closing time in order to get our van fixed. <laughs> So that we could get up here. It's, and I'll tell you, it's one of those things that it can be easy to look at the negative of it, but we were rejoicing because through it all, God just showed himself to be a great big God who helps us out through all of our trials. And uh, so we are extra blessed to be here because there was a period yesterday where we were going, we don't know if we're going to make, like, we don't know what we're going to do. Like, we were calling rental car companies. They weren't open. We were going, all right, maybe we can rent a U-Haul pickup truck. I mean, I kid you, we were, we were at that stage of, can we rent two U-Haul pickup trucks and each put a boy in one and drive up here? But thankfully, we didn't have to do that. We showed up here with our van. Um, so we are children's missionaries to the country of Burundi. And I'll, let's just deal with the elephant in the room. Where's Burundi? I've never heard of it before. We get that a lot. Uh, Burundi is located in East Central Africa. We, if we can have that next slide. Um, it is located on the shore of Lake Tanganyika, which is the second largest lake in the world by volume. And it is just south of Rwanda, right next to Tanzania. It is about the size of uh, Massachusetts. Okay, so if you're from Massachusetts or a visitor, it's about the same size. has almost twice as many people and is the third youngest nation in the world. You see, Burundi's median age is just 17 years old. 45% of their population is under the age of 14. They are bursting with kids. And one of the reasons Marissa and I are so excited about getting to go to Burundi is that we get to invest in a new generation for Christ. And in fact, if you know anything about investing, you know that if you had... Uh, first bought, if you bought $100 worth of stock in 1980 when Apple computers first went public, today that $100 would be worth $67,000. That's a pretty good return on investment. But Jesus said that there was a sower who went out and began to sow seeds, right? And he sowed it and it landed in rocky soil, in, in um, dry soil, in bad soil, and in good soil. Right, And it was eaten by birds, it was choked by vines, and it dried up in the sun. But that good soil returned an investment a hundred times what had been put into it. We believe that Burundi today is that good soil. It is a place that is ripe for investment into the next generation for Jesus Christ. And Burundi is good soil despite a history that may not look great on paper. In fact, it doesn't just not look great. It isn't great. If you heard of the Hutus and the Tutsis made famous in Rwanda in 1994, the same people groups live in Burundi and have had the same cultural challenges in Burundi. In fact, Burundi has been independent since 1962, so it's 58 years old. It's had two genocides, multiple coups, and a 12-year civil war that ended in 2005. During this time, hundreds of thousands of Burundians have fled the country. It has left Burundi fractured and divided with a government that struggles to meet the basic needs of its people. Because of this, Burundians are a deeply hurting people. Because throughout it all, Burundi has claimed to be a Christian nation run by men who claim on paper to be Christians. And Burundi's younger generation, and there's a lot of them, is beginning to turn to other religions, specifically Islam. 
Islam is not a, a very heavy presence in Burundi now, but it's getting there. If you know anything about Africa, you know that Muslims have a plan for Africa, and it starts with children. If you go visit the country of Zanzibar, you can go into one of their schools where kids go, it, it, they're, they're bought and paid for by Muslims, and kids go there for two hours before school every day, and for those two hours, they memorize the Quran. And in Burundi, what happens is we have a poor and desperate people. I said Burundi is the third youngest nation in the world. Burundi is also the third poorest nation in the world. So you have a desperate people who are sick and tired of watching their relatives and family and friend murder each other, oftentimes by people who claim to be Christians, and they see a new religion that comes in, builds large buildings, and says, we have a hope for you. Now we understand that that hope is a false hope tied to a false God who does not exist, but it's enticing and alluring to a new generation that is getting raised up. If, if you would show the next... Uh, slide, you can do the next one. Part of what attracts Marissa and I to Burundi is this chance to make a big impact. 5.5 million people, uh, excuse me, 5.5 million children live in Burundi. And with the size as small as it is, our team can travel from one end of the country to the other in about four hours. To give it some, pers some perspective, because I know when someone says to me something's the size of Massachusetts, I'm like, yeah, so what? I mean, okay. Uh, Burundi is about the size of the Wisconsin Dells to Kenosha, that same size, if you've ever traveled that. We want to be clear that we think that God has called us to Burundi for such a time as this. When I was about 22 or 23 years old, Marissa and I were attending a missions convention at our church that we were at. You see, I, I mentioned how we had first started showing our interest for each other. I've, called in, I've been called into mission since I was eight years old. But my whole life has been directed to the country of Madagascar. Long before those penguins made the place famous, I knew I wanted to go to Madagascar. We attended a missions convention, 22, 23 years old, and I was talking to a missionary there, and he said, John, you seem very sure about where you're going to go. What are you going to do if your sending organization wants to send you somewhere other than Madagascar? And I said, I won't go. Madagascar is my calling. Some of you have done the math. You're going, you're not going to Madagascar, you're going to Burundi. Are you just a bad speller? <laughs> what happened is, is that we experienced Burundi for ourselves. If you would show the next picture. One more after that, thank you. In 2019, October, Marissa and I got to go to Burundi ourselves as part of a, um, a missions trip specifically geared for children's pastors to help teach their leaders and to help them um, learn how to do children's ministry. And while we were there, we fell in love with the people, the culture, and the land. And as one of our times, as one of our days was coming to an end, and uh, we were looking back on it, God began to speak to me very clearly. Maybe he's spoken this to you at some point in your life. He said, John, the path to get you here was never straight. It's taken a lot of detours. You've, you've gone maybe through a lot of cul-de-sacs and dead ends. God's like, that was you, not me, but you know. <laughs> and he goes, but the path to get you to Madagascar won't be straight either. Trust me. And I knew when we left Burundi in that moment that our first time on the field would not be to Madagascar, but would be to somewhere else. And in fact, we love Burundi. We wanted to go back, but there was no prospects. See, there's been no AGWM missionaries in Burundi in over 10 years. At the time, there was no one on the ground, no prospects of anyone being on the ground. Marissa and I are looking and going, God, we would love to come back, but this doesn't look possible. How many of you know when you tell God this doesn't look possible? He takes it personally. We came home in October. In March, when we got appointed uh, by the Assemblies of God, they sat us down and they said, John, you have three options of countries you can go to. You can go to Uganda, which I had visited in college and loved. You can go to Madagascar. And you can go to Burundi. And we knew in that moment that, yes, Madagascar was being offered to us. But if God had not spoken so crystal clear to us, we, we may have made a choice he didn't want us to make. Marissa didn't even let me speak. She said, we're going to Burundi. <laughs> it's okay. We talked about it. We knew. But it's God doing incredible things, and we believe that he has called us to Burundi for such 
a time as this. I don't want to get long-winded, but I will tell you, uh, as of just two weeks ago, half of our team is currently on the ground in Burundi and is beginning to find housing and transportation is beginning to settle in to Burundi. But we are looking for people who want to partner with us today on a monthly basis who believe that Burundi is a chance to invest in the kingdom, who's willing to put money into the only retirement package that matters, the kingdom retirement package. We, we need your prayers. We absolutely need your prayers. Uh, and we have prayer cards out in the lobby that we would love for you to take. If you have a family or a family member, a friend who also wants one, take some extras. We've got plenty. We don't want to take them with us. We want to leave them here with you. But these prayers are important. Some of our friends, the Osbournes, are missionaries in the Ukraine. And, la and during their first term, they were experiencing a time of intense spiritual warfare to the point where they could feel it. Have you ever been there where you felt the spiritual warfare in your life? It was oppressive. And Wendy said what happened was every day at about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that spiritual warfare would loosen. It would come off. And what was happening was her friends and family back home were getting in their prayer closets and were praying for them. Prayer matters, absolutely. We want you to take some of these home. We also have some of these. These are prayer guides for Africa's children. Africa is the youngest continent in the world. And we, uh, the Assemblies of God, is looking to send 25 new children's missionaries to Africa by 2025. These are the greatest places with the greatest needs. We would love it if you took some of these home with you. And if you would begin praying for God to raise up more children's missionaries to go to Africa, maybe someone from this church. And then finally, we have some uh, forms right here. If you feel led, like God is telling you to partner with us on a monthly basis, we're looking for about five partners who want to join us and who want to give into Burundi on a monthly basis, partner with us. We have some forms here. We can fill them out. We make it real easy. You don't have to take anything home. We'll mail it in. And, and we would just love to be able to do that with you because we believe that God is calling us for such a time as this. The leadership of the Burundi Assemblies of God is passionate for kids and is ready to see their nation change. And I will tell you something, it is so enticing to meet with leaders who are dreaming God-sized dreams because they can't do anything on their own. They're the third poorest nation in the world, but they know they serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And we want to be a part of that, and we'd love it if you would be a part of it too. Pastor Larry, thank you.
shorter than an hour sessions, and then we would have an interview with you as deacons and myself, find out how you want to fit into the life of the church. Love to have you do that if you want to be a member. Okay, let's go ahead and look at, at Jude. Uh, can we go to the next slide here? And I'm really focusing on verse 24. Verse 25 is kind of an explosion of praise, which I think we just kind of did. But here's one of the reasons we have to praise God. Let's, let's read this together, could we? It's the word of God. Let's read it together. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. All right. That's, that's, a, that's both an adoration and praise of God and a promise. And I want to talk about that today. So kind of a crazy story I want to tell you. Always good for a crazy story. There's a man that stepped out onto the road, and he thought he could get across the other side, but a car was coming, aiming right for him. And so he ran ahead a little bit, and the car aimed for him over there. And then he ran to the other side, and the car aimed for him right there. And he was so frustrated, he stood there frozen. And the car almost hit him, but stopped just in time. And wouldn't you know it, it was a squirrel driving it. And he said, well, see there, it's not so easy, is it? <laughs> and that's what this year has been like. It has been shaking at every level. I mean, whether it's affected your employment or your relationships, we could not even go be with our grandchildren over Thanksgiving, had tickets and everything, just of how, you know, it was a fresh outbreak both here and there. It has been... Um, it's shattering in some ways. It's been a shaking. And yet we have these promises of God that I think today would do us just a lot of good if we would just focus on them. So uh, you have an outline there in your bulletin, and uh, let's get started there. Um, I've got good news to start with. These our promises are true. God does care about you. Uh, he has not changed his mind, even though COVID came. Uh, the devil is not winning, just so you know yeah, and our Savior is getting ready to take us to heaven. Woo, so, and that's all because of the keeping power of Jesus Christ in spite of all this stuff. So, you know, Jude, if you're familiar with the book now, it's a lot of it's not good news. It's like false prophets and teachers are going to come into the church and they're going to try to get you to believe this and believe that and it's all wrong. And yet he finishes with such assurance that those that love and serve the Lord will be okay in eternity, right? So as you're going through the ups and downs, there are some promises today. And notice what he says here. I want to pick on the word stumbling and the word fault. Many of you have children. You've had to walk across the street with them. And virtually that child's life was in your hands as, as you held their hand, right? Would you let it go if a car was coming? No. No. In fact, often you draw them nearer as these dangerous opportunities come. You either pull them into your side or lift them up. How could we think that our Heavenly Father isn't at least that good to us? Right. When danger comes to us, he pulls us closer. He's got promises to assure us that, that we are the apple of his eye. We are his precious possession. He wants us to be close with him. Even when we don't feel it, we take those by faith. So it is saying here, and stumbling is when you fall into sin. So as you fall, he's going to reach to grab you. You'll just be willing to allow him to do that. Keep you from stumbling. And this word without fault is interesting because you remember in Ephesians 5, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to husbands and to wives. And a lot of teaching there I can't get into. But he says, husbands, love your wives the way Christ loves the church by the washing of the water of the word that he might make her without spot or wrinkle. Do you remember that? As God washes his church by the washing of the water with the word, and by the way, men, that's our responsibility at home is to bring the word out and wash our family with the word just to bring it out there. Jesus is preparing his church. Imagine that to be without spot and without wrinkle. And that's what he'll have by the last day is a church that he is already in love with but is so acting like the bride that it would be easy for him to take us back. I feel like God's doing that already. So he's keeping us from stumbling and keeping us without fault. Then he says he's going to present us. And that word in the original Greek means to make you stand. It's as if, like when you're a little kid, you made an art project at home. And you brought it home to your mom and dad. And you were so happy with it and proud. And you said, Mom, Dad, look at what I made. And, of course, they oohed and odd. And 
bought you some McDonald's something. I mean, it was, it was all just being proud of that project. And it's kind of that thing. Um, he is, uh, Jesus is going to present us as the bride of Christ to his father. And we are going to be standing after much, many battles. Now, the, the present is, is really almost kind of a battle word. You know, you're in a battle. We, we, we've discussed that. We're in a battle today for, for righteousness and truth, even in our own country. And yet it promises in Ephesians chapter 6 that having done all, the people of God will stand. Yeah. See, when you're in a battle, the winner stands. The loser falls. Yep. And actually, we're on the aggression here. Doesn't it say that the gates of hell won't be able to stand against the church? Won't prevail? We're attacking hell. We're pushing back righteousness with light. Light wins over darkness every time, right? And you are that light. So he is going to make you stand firm to the end. Let me read that verse to you. He says, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, hello, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand, a victor, stand firm then. So you're standing in the righteousness of Christ no matter what comes our way. And then finally he says, with great joy. So you would think, well, hold it. We're going, going through all these problems. We may have financial struggles. There are all the things that we can be going through right now. He promises great joy in the middle of it, if you'll choose that, great joy. Do you remember the story? This is kind of a Christmas Bible story that we get into about this time of year. You know, Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and her kind of cousin, Elizabeth, became pregnant too. And so Mary came to actually help Elizabeth, who was a little more pregnant than her. And when Mary, who was also pregnant, got close to Elizabeth, you know what happened? The baby John the Baptist leapt inside of Elizabeth's womb because he was close to the Savior. Now, what does that say about life in the womb, by the way? Yeah, what does that say? But beyond that, it tells me something about when you get close to Jesus. What happens? Hey, if you're a dollar old sourpuss Christian, that's your fault. You can, you can be as nasty and angry as you want. But the truth is, getting close to Jesus brings this. Joy. Joy. John the Baptist was leaping even before. Okay, nobody walk out on me. You know, I know I'm getting tough. <laughs> getting close to Jesus brings joy. Because joy is the product of being unburdened. Listen, if you don't have that yet, come back for grace. Because when you're unburdened with your sin and your past, and you know the shame and the guilt is gone, you're a free being. And that's what the Lord has for you today. So I want to talk about what our confidence is based on. If we could have the next slide first, the sufficiency of Christ. You maybe have heard these terms before, but I want to talk about them a little more thoroughly. The question would be, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus, did he do enough to secure your eternal future? Yes, he did. He did everything and more. And that's why Paul could say in Colossians 2.10, In him, you, believers, have been made complete. And that word complete means to render something perfect or finished. So there's actually, in your life, when you accept the Holy Spirit, there's a part of you that's perfect already, even though you don't act like it. You're sanctified deep within. You're trying to act that out. You're becoming more and more sanctified into what's called the final blessing. The final sanctification is when he takes you home to be with him in heaven. Jesus is our sufficiency. You don't need anybody else or any other thing. He's enough to get you into heaven. Simple focus on Jesus Christ. Actually, all the scripture speaks of Jesus. He says, you guys search the scriptures, but what do they speak of? Him. They speak about Jesus. So it, we should read the scriptures in light of, it, that's our filter, Jesus' fulfillment of what God called him to do. The second thing is his abilities, John 10, 28 and 29. It's a pretty firm, confident statement. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So, you know, you're thinking, i do not sure I know the Lord today. I've kind of blown it. I, you know, things just seem rather dark out there. You need to, rest, you need to bring your faith in line with the Word of God. That he is keeping you. If you've given your heart to the Lord, he
He is keeping you. That's just a problem, whether you feel like it or not. The third thing is the fact that he's interceding for you. Now, when I get sick or I'm dealing with certain symptoms or problems, I'll often ask a brother or sister and say, hey, would you pray for me? And, and they will, and I'm glad for their prayer. But think about it when you ask Jesus to pray for you. If there's anybody that has favor with the Father, it's Jesus. And you know what it says he's doing constantly? He's ever interceding for the needs of God's people. Constantly talking to the Father. So you have you know, throne room of God, Jesus seated at his right hand, and they're talking about us. The promise of your salvation is that you have an intercessor, that's like a lawyer, like an advocate in God's throne. And that's out of Hebrews 7.25. He is able, it says, to save completely those who come to God through him. There's no way to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Don't try to pull this I believe in God stuff and leave Jesus out. You can't do it. It doesn't work. No, you either get Jesus in there or you don't got it. He says, none can come to the Father but through me. You go through Jesus, which means that life-altering relationship called being born again, truly born again. You give your heart to him. He washes you clean. It happens in a moment, and you're changed forever. You bet. Do you believe in that, by the way? The yeah. yeah, okay. And then the final one is the promises of Jesus Christ. There's so many. But in John 17, verse 11, I'll just share this one. Uh, Jesus said, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be in the world any longer. But my disciples are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Father. This is kind of a prayer. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So we've got the biggest, greatest being in the universe protecting us day by day. Those are the claims of the Bible um, and what Jude is presenting for us today. What that means is when you come to Christ, you get a clean conscience. It's, it's really an appeal for a clean conscience before God. You're a new creation, the removal of all your guilt over what you've done in the past, righteousness bursting from within you when you come to Christ, and the knowledge of your adoption as a child of God. And when somebody's been in a foster home or whatever, and, and those foster homes maybe aren't always that great, when they finally get adopted into a good home, it's a life-changing experience. And that's what we have through Jesus Christ. So i gotta, I got to talk about warnings, though, because you're going, well, yeah, I like all those promises, but what about the warnings of the Bible? And I, <laughs> I will tell you, in spirit-filled churches, we have a tendency to try to make people more insecure than secure. We just do. And the tragedy with that is I think most of us need to know we're very secure in Christ. Yeah. The way we want to... We want people to be insecure as those that really haven't accepted him yet or think they have and don't have God really truly in their life. But so there's a guy that went to get uh, a, a shave at a barber. He thought, you know, hey, I don't do this very often. I'm going to go down to the barber and get a shave. And he went to the barber shop where the pastor's wife uh, was the barber. Is that a barberess? I don't know what a girl barber is. But her, his name, her name was Grace, and he goes in there and says, Grace, I don't do this very often, but I'm going to ask for a shave. And so she does all the, you know, the strap and all the stuff and does a really good job. And she said, well, that'll be $20. And so he expected a break. He said, thought in his heart, 20 bucks for a shave. He didn't say it to her. He gave her the 20 and he left. Next morning, he woke up and he gets ready to shave himself. And he looked and there was no stubble. He thought, wow, that was a good shave. It didn't even come back today. And then the next day, he woke up. And there was no stubble. And it happened for two entire weeks, and he's astounded. Man, she did a good job. And so he went, and he said, you know, ma'am, she was in the barber shop. I said, ma'am, I need to apologize. I kind of got mad after you charged me that $20. And, and uh, now, you know, it's lasted so long. I just want to tell you I'm sorry. And she says, you shouldn't be surprised because you were shaved by grace, and once shaved, always shaved. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about that because I don't totally buy into that doctrine. It's only because of some warnings of the Bible that I take serious. I take the Bible seriously. And I think if God gives us warnings, we should know them and look at them. I'm going to give you a couple. Matthew 5.29. You've probably heard most of these. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Throw it away. In other words, if you start heading into a sinful pattern, deal with it. 
That's sin. If you're struggling with your walk with God right now, it's either that you're being deceived by the devil about who you really are in Christ, or you've developed a sinful pattern. And that sinful pattern is pulling you away from him. So just deal with it. Doesn't he say, there's a promise, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, how hard is that? You say, Lord, I'm sorry, I blew it. Somebody say that's not hard. So it's easy. He said it's better for you to lose your hand or to lose your eye than to lose your whole body when it's thrown in hell. So there's a warning in there. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He's just saying deal with your sin. Another one out of Hebrews chapter 6. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Well, I would say that's some pretty scary stuff. To their loss, they crucify the Son of God all over again and subject him to public disgrace. And these are books that are written basically to Christian churches. And then 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. So serious warnings here. Does God want anybody to miss out on the promises? Absolutely not. Like when you tell your child not to touch the stove or take the car tonight or ever look in your wallet or whatever it is. Those are things you want them to stay away from and there are penalties involved in it. And the single answer to every warning of the Bible is this, a living faith. It's not a work, it's not giving away more money, it's not joining another ministry. Those may be included, but God has always Old Testament and New Testament ask for one thing, a living faith. And it's not, I need to say this because people in America so often, yeah, I believe in God. It just doesn't cut it for me. You know, I asked a brother the other day, I said, are, are you walking with Jesus? And boy, he got mad. Well, and so maybe he's not a brother. But you know what I'm saying? If somebody asks me, I'm walking for Jesus, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to be glad he cares. I mean, I don't. I hope you didn't think I was implying anything. I'm just saying, how's the walk with Jesus going? And if that bothers you, you don't have one. Right? right? right. All these promises are waiting for you. It's like food in the refrigerator for you to eat and say, yes, by faith, I'm trusting Jesus Christ for my eternity. These are genuine warnings. For It's Jesus saying to you, please stand by faith. By the way, isn't it interesting that we have the word faith? Faith and a word that comes out of it in the Greek that we translate faithful. And faith has a component of faithfulness. Was Jesus faithful to us? Yes. Yeah, he didn't come and just do part of the job. He did the whole job. So when you give your life to Christ with genuine faith and surrender, to be faithful is to live your life that way with genuine faith and surrender and not give up, correct? Right. I mean, would you give, give a guy a full 40 hours pay if he worked just Monday morning and didn't show up? Heck no. And so God is saying, you just stay faithful to me through the ups and downs, not based on how much work you do or how much money you give or what church you go to. Well, I think you're really smart if you come to this church. But beyond that, the, uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. The truth is a living faith in you will answer what you're supposed to do with your life. And that's why it says faith without works is dead. Well, you can just check what, what is faith doing to my life. And if faith has changed you, you're safe. You're safe. If it's changed you, if there's this, this Christ-likeness in your life, you're safe. So let's go to this next slide. I want to throw you, show you kind of three things that um, – do we have another slide? Or, that, oh, I forgot this one. Okay, you're right. I forgot the right one. Not your fault. You guys are perfect. I'm not. I appreciate those guys. Okay. These are three areas you can check on whether or not you have a living faith. And I mean, these are just honest. I'm not pointing at anybody. These are things I have to check myself by because I want the promise of God. And I will tell you before I read these, I stand, you, I stand before you as a believer that knows he's going to hell. Yeah, you can't convince me. I know that I'm, I've had that kind of life change. No doubt. If today could be my last day, I have no doubt. Because of the promise of God. And you shouldn't either. You shouldn't either. You shouldn't have any doubt. You should be able to stand before whoever and say, I know I'm going to heaven. Number one, you are trusting Jesus alone to get you to heaven. That's, 
That's the first check of true, genuine, saving faith, and a living faith is you're trusting him alone. So I would ask you, should you become totally disabled or, or you're older, you can't get out of bed, you can't do a single thing for the Lord, are you still saved? Yes. Absolutely. You can't do any work, what you would call work, because you're trusting in the Lord. Number one. Number two, you have a desire to know him better and serve him more. However that shows up, a desire. Really, one way, okay, you can't really get around this one, so I'm going to bring it up. A test of our love for God is how we love others. Read 1 John. How can you say you love God when you don't love your brother? And I know loving your brother is pretty hard, especially if it's your natural brother. They're horrible. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, but you've got to love them. So you have a desire to grow into to loving God and serving God by, by loving other people. It's all, it's all by love, right? Your faith generates a genuine love. There's at least a desire. Maybe it's not happening. Maybe you haven't found your ministry yet. But you want to be useful in the kingdom of God. Then number three, you, your, heart, your humble heart desires more truth. Those three are great filters to look through to say, I have a living faith today. You're trusting in Jesus completely to get you to heaven. You desire to help others as service for Christ and to know him better. And number three, a humble heart that thrust, uh, sorry, thirsts for more truth. Okay, one last little story. We're going to worship. In the Dr. Seuss book, I told you I'd get deeply spiritual. The book is called Horton Hears a Who. Horton the Elephant hears a cry for help coming from a speck of dust. And even though he can't see anyone on the speck, he decides to help it out. As it turns out, that speck of dust is home to a clan called the Who's, who live in the city of Whoville. And Horton agrees to help protect the Who's and their home. But this gives him nothing but torment from his neighbors who refuse to believe that anything is even on that speck. Still, Horton stands by the motto, after all, a person is a person, no matter how small. That's his motto. That's his code. Through his many trials and tribulations, Horton perseveres and says this profound thing. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant, for an elephant is faithful. You know, actually, the guy that writes these things has some very deep spiritual truth. But I want to be faithful. I didn't say perfect 100%. There's no way you're getting that out of me. But I do want to be faithful. Faithful to God. Faithful to the call. Um, faithful to these sweet promises that give me such confidence today. Amen. And I know faith will bring faithfulness from us. Let's just pray. Father, for anyone that might need to take that step of fully embracing Jesus Christ, would you just wrap your arms around him right now? And friend, if you just need to confess to Jesus that you have fallen short of his glory, right now he will cleanse you. You know, he went to the cross to pay for your salvation. And it's paid for if you'll just accept it. You can say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I choose you for the rest of my life. He will. Angels will start rejoicing in heaven. And a pen will come out and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and there will be some joy in your soul. And you'll start a great journey, a forever journey with Jesus. For those that have maybe fallen a little bit short lately and maybe let darkness creep in, all God's asking is for faithfulness. Would you come back to being faithful? Just faithful to the Lord. Whatever that means, Holy Spirit's probably been talking to you about it. Just in your prayer time right now. Whatever, you know, picture comes to mind or person or idea that maybe he's been talking to you about, about being faithful about. Do that. In fact, do it today or commit to doing it soon so that you will be 100% faithful. Beyond that, Father, we just revel in the promises of your security in us that in Jesus we got this game made. We are the winners. We are standing and we will continue to stand. We long for the trumpet 
glowing in heaven that says it's all going to be over and our Savior comes back for us. A tough day, but a glorious day to be with you for eternity. And I want all my friends to walk in the assurance, not the hope of it, God, but the surety of it. For faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's evidence in our soul. We give it to you, Father. Take this precious moment and seal the deal. And water that seed, Holy Spirit. That we would be a confident people in all that Jesus did for us. It's in that name we pray, everybody said.